so uh, I have one older brother, and he, uh, when we were growing up, he was obsessed with Lego. Anybody else a lover of Lego at some point? Yeah, I got some nods of the head. Okay, great. And he was one of those Lego builders where he would take the instructions and he had to follow the instructions exactly. Like every piece had its spot and that was it. Couldn't go beyond that. And he was such a fan of Lego and organization and whatever, that when he learned how to use Excel spreadsheets, he decided that he was going to put on the spreadsheet what pieces he had and how many and keep track of it all because how dare he lose a piece. And then a few years ago, when uh, he went on this mission, and it was right before he and his wife had their first child, so I'm convinced it was a nesting phase, where he went and found all of his Lego and all of the instructions, and he built everything that he has ever owned. And then any piece that was missing, he would go on this website, find that missing piece, order it so he could complete this set. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a Lego lover in the house. He's an engineer now, which is to nobody's shock. But as his little sister growing up, I uh, knew my role, as I've always known my role as a little sister, and that's to be as annoying as possible. So I would shove my hand in that Lego bucket and I would pull out whatever pieces I wanted to and I would put them together in whatever way I wanted to because who needs instructions? Not me. Or I would get just like super close to a project that he was working on or I would just like look at it out of curiosity and panic would set in. And one time I walked a little bit too close to his 2000 piece uh, Star Wars fighter jet thingy. And I was just curious and I really just got used to hearing the don't touch that because I would break it. So Lego is this big phenomenon. It seems to be this bit of a timeless toy. And now my four year old nephew is learning to also love Lego. And so it seems to be the play that never ends and spans across generations. But did you know that in the early 2000s, Lego almost went bankrupt? Couldn't imagine a life without Lego. So at that point, Lego was producing thousands and thousands of molds for bricks, and they even had three theme parks. They had one in the US, one in England, and one in Germany. So you would think that because of this, they would be booming. They were expanding so rapidly. So obviously they're doing really well, but it was actually to their detriment. They were losing money and nearly went bankrupt. So when new leadership came in, they wanted to try to rebuild this basically destroyed company. What they realized is that Lego forgot their why. Why does Lego even exist? They exist to inspire and to develop kids' ability to think creatively and to imagine new possibilities of what could be. But in this really, at this effort to expand, they forgot that and why they existed in the first place. So when this new leadership came in, they went, quote unquote, back to the brick. They reduced the number of molds of bricks that they were uh, building, and they sold off all three amusement parks. And so they stripped it down just to focus in on their mission, just creative and imaginative play. And slowly but surely, they were able to rebuild, and now they're still thriving, which then lets my nephew experience the joy of building something that will house his dinosaurs. The imagination is quite stunning. Now, there's a person in scripture that also did some rebuilding, and he did rebuilding not with Lego, um, but with other things that had implications beyond the wildest imagination. And it's the story of Nehemiah, and that's where we're going to park it today. So I want to set up a bit of a brief overview of this story. So Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, and um, that was his job. I don't know if that's what he imagined for himself when he considered what he wanted to be, where he grew, what he wanted to be when he grew up, but it's kind of where he ended up. And he basically just had to stay close by to the drinks that the king would have been served to make sure that no one poisoned the king. So it's like, oh, what do you do for a living? I watch drinks. Seems like quite a thrill. Or maybe my imagination just doesn't do the job justice. But with this role, it also meant that he had close proximity to the ins and outs of what were going on around the king. So the cupbearer had to be incredibly trustworthy since they would have been privy to a lot of confidential information. Now again, I'm not sure how Nehemiah got this job. I don't know if he wanted to be that or if it just fell in his lap. I don't know if he enjoyed it or if he was doing just what was required of him. But all we can really know is that he proved that he was trustworthy. 
and maybe that you've been in a situation or a job, maybe currently, where you weren't totally sure why you were there. Or maybe you love and know exactly why you're in this season that you're in. Regardless, in each space and place that we find ourselves in, it's a season that is never wasted in God's kingdom. It's never wasted. For Nehemiah, he faithfully served in the season that he was in, being the cupbearer for the king. And unbeknownst to him at that time, he was positioned perfectly to step into what God was going to be calling him into next. But he had to be in this season of being the cupbearer for a while. There is no time wasted in God's kingdom. In each season, there's this opportunity where God wants to prepare us. So in the confusing and in the mundane, in the chaos, in the desire for something else, even in the contentedness, God can use each moment as an opportunity to prepare us and to shape us. And it allows him to mold us and to develop our character and to prepare us for something else he might be calling us into. And if we use Nehemiah's story as an example, there is no way he could have envisioned the call that was coming. But rather instead, he chose to pursue living with integrity and being totally trustworthy and being super intentional with the relationships he had in that space. One of Hope Story's partners is with a church in Burkina Faso. You can go to the next one. Uh, and John Tandamba is the pastor there. And I asked him once how he came to know Jesus. And it's quite the story that I'm not going to get into today. Also, it's his story to tell. But what's profound about his story is what he chose to do after he made this decision. So he knew that this is a, a unique season, fresh. And he had to keep himself close to the church to try to figure out what was this Christian life even all about. So he simply committed to sweeping the floors of the church each week. Pretty simple. He was faithfully obedient in those days, ensuring that the church where his community worshipped was kept tidy. But in the process of that, of simply sweeping the floors, God was growing something in him. And his spiritual life was growing, but also God was preparing him for a call that was coming. And so week after week, he showed up, broom in hand, and swept the dust away. And in a way, God also dusted away something in him, preparing him for clarity in this vision. Now, John pastors the church, but he couldn't have started there. He had to start sweeping the floors. And his church in this community has now built a school, a vocational school, and a medical center. So it started as sweeping in the church. God didn't waste any of that time. And he prepared John for this bigger vision of renewal in his community in Burkina Faso. Or we can take Cindy, which is the next slide, who lives in Zambia. And in the season when she was mothering her toddler, she would sit on her front porch and just read to her son, really taking each moment captive to foster a healthy bond with her son and to spark his imagination through reading. It's simple, really. And then all of a sudden, these neighborhood kids start joining in on these reading sessions on the porch. And she starts to realize there's this gap in education for kids. And so she and her husband recognize this need. And then her husband, who happens to be the pastor at the church, kick into high gear to figure out what do we need to do to support these vulnerable kids in our community who are falling through the cracks of the education system. So she was faithful to where she was at, mothering her son, and then bam, out comes this bigger vision of renewal in her community. And now they've started a community center there to help meet this need. So she was positioned perfectly as she mothered her son. So going back to Nehemiah, he was living his life, doing the thing that cupbearers do. And then he gets this news that the wall in Jerusalem had been torn down and the gates had been destroyed by fire. And this deeply, deeply grieved him. He was so distraught by the news that he couldn't hide his sadness in front of the king. Now, some of us have better poker faces than others, and I'm pretty convinced that Nehemiah had a good poker face since he had never once looked sad in front of the king before. 
So if you're someone who can't quite hide your emotions, I don't recommend pursuing the role of cupbearer because emotions couldn't get in the way. But Nehemiah, he's pretty good at it. But on this day, Nehemiah was so distraught, he could not hide his grief. It overcame him with so much power. But he still showed up to work, and then the king asked him what was wrong. Now, Nehemiah knew he was risking everything. He could lose a lot over admitting this. But with great boldness, he asked the king if he could be relieved of his duties to go help with the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem. So imagine you're a boss and your employee walks into your office and is like, I'm so distraught over the state of such and such a place, I'm going to quit, move there, and go help them. Like, no pre-warning, out of the blue, resignation letter is on your desk, and bam, they want to leave. Any employer in their right mind would say, whoa, 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 slow down, sit down, let's talk about this. Where is this coming from? Maybe you should sleep on it for one night at least, because quitting and moving out of impulse doesn't quite seem like the most rational thing to do here. But the king said yes, and he said, all right, Nehemiah, there's clearly something going on that I don't know about, so I relieve you of your duties, go. Clearly, the Holy Spirit is doing some work here in everyone, because he paved the way for Nehemiah to be obedient to this call that had been get come into his life, though I don't think he actually knew it was a call. It was just this urgent situation that he felt deeply, deeply compelled to respond to. So he was free to go. King was like, all right, have at it. But before he left, Nehemiah, a man of great faith and courage, decided, okay, I'm going to ask the king for one more thing. It's working so far. So he asked the king for some important letters that he could take with him to gain important access on a political level when he got to Jerusalem. And the king doesn't even question it. Signs off, hands him the papers, and says, I'll be on your way, Nehemiah. So Nehemiah had been positioned perfectly in this role, working with the king, to be able to get these letters. And because he lived his life with integrity and proved his trustworthiness, it made him easier to have allies to support him on this mission. God had given Nehemiah a vision this massive vision of renewal. And it was a vision that went so deep in Nehemiah that he couldn't hide it and he couldn't shake it. And God often puts nudges in certain people to lead out in these visions of renewal. So Nehemiah heads out everything he needs in hand, ready to go check on the destroyed wall in Jerusalem. So we're going to turn to Nehemiah 2, verse 11 to 16. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate, through the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate in the king's pool but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Now there's a bunch of names and things going on in these verses, but what Nehemiah was doing was checking in on the state of what was going on. So it's one thing to have this vision, this vision that's kind of way up here, but it's a whole other thing to take that vision down to ground reality. What would the community need? How would this vision play out practically? So Nehemiah trusted that God had given him the call, so he went. But he then observed what was going on to strategize how to best make things happen. Nehemiah didn't just walk into Jerusalem with it all figured out and saying, got the plan, guys. He was obedient to the call. Yes, he went. But then he humbly became part of the pain of the people, ready to partner with them right where they were at and ready to partner with God in how this vision of renewal was going to pan out. 
So Nehemiah has taken stock of the situation and in due time brings others into this vision. So in Nehemiah 2 verses 17 to 18 says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So Nehemiah lays out what's going on. He's done the observing. And then he calls them into this mission with him. It's impossible, an impossible task for one person to do. It would take tons and tons of hands. But together, it could be done. I want to tell you about Liliana. It's the next slide. There she is. And she's one of the pastors at Hope Stories Church Partner in Columbia. And Liliana, like Nehemiah, walked the streets of her community observing the great need. She was on the ground, she saw it, she lived the pain with the people. And the need wasn't a literal broken wall, but it was a metaphorical wall that had been destroyed. There were generational cycles of poverty that were continuing, single parent homes and half day school systems that left vulnerable kids to the ways of the streets. Sexual abuse ran rampant, leaving deep marks of trauma and distrust and many bellies were left empty from a lack of nutrition and meals throughout the day. So she observed this need, this deep, deep need within her community, and out of a great love and a massive vision, she called out this need for renewal. God implanted something so deep within her heart, and what started as bringing food to people on the streets, right where they were at, has now turned into two community centers that provide educational support, meals, some fun, and, uh, wow. Great. Love it. Okay, back on track. And uh, psychological healing to these vulnerable kids. These centers are literally breaking generational cycles of poverty and giving hope to these kids' stories. But her vision doesn't stop there. In our recent webinar series with each of our Hope Story partners, I asked Liliana what she was envisioning for the future. She doesn't want to stop with just two centers. That's not enough. What she wants is a center in each of the communes in Medellin, Colombia. It's a total of 12 centers. And here's the thing with God-sized visions of renewal. They should scare us. If it feels impossible, you're probably on the right track. Because if the visions of renewal felt easy, we wouldn't need to be dependent on God to do the miraculous, and we wouldn't need to be dependent on each other to each play our part. And frankly, Liliana has called all of us to join in the rebuilding of the wall in her community with her and her church community. She is a Nehemiah among us, along with her Spider-Man sidekick right there. In these visions of renewal, it's not just for a beautification project. It's a matter of urgency on behalf of the vulnerable. It's a matter of necessity in rewriting narratives so they're lathered in hope and empowerment and not steeped in destruction and despair. God's heart for the poor is evident throughout all of Scripture, and the story of Nehemiah is no different. When Nehemiah went to the rebuilding of the wall, the wall in and of itself was going to help relieve poverty. But as Nehemiah was there, he's noticing the poverty goes deeper. And so this is when we turn to Nehemiah 5, verses 1 to 4. It says, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. So the more that Nehemiah is in, the more he's realizing the poverty these people are facing. And so in Nehemiah 5, verses 6 to 7, this is how he responds. 
When I heard their outcry in these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. Sounds like a call into the principal's office. Couple things with this. First off, Nehemiah pondered the news in his mind. He didn't just react out of his anger. That would have been unproductive. So he took hold, like what's being shared, and he thought through what is the best response here. So he paused, he observed, and he asked the questions. When it comes to being in the middle of these visions of renewal, it requires presence and it requires relationships. It's one thing to have a theory about relieving poverty or a theory about anything, really. It's a whole other thing to let yourself be face to face with what's going on, to be in the mess and in the chaos of it all. And since Nehemiah was present for the rebuilding of this wall, he was able to see and take note of things going on that he wouldn't have known if he wasn't there. And then to think through well what the next steps forward should be and what his role should be. Which then begs the question for us. Are we willing to go face to face with poverty? Are we willing to enter into these broken places with people? And are we willing to play the part that we might be called into? And Nehemiah, already in the middle of it all, knew his position. And he had the opportunity to address the injustice to the poor directly with the nobles and the officials. And he would have been respected in that setting because of how much he was already doing. He's not just some dude going in with a bunch of random ideas and a burst of anger. He knows what's going on. It's personal for him. But then he also has that background of working for the king. So in these spaces of working together to eliminate poverty, first off, are we in it? And second, it's important to consider what our position could be. And maybe it is talking to government officials like Nehemiah, but that's definitely not going to be for everybody. And because I'm here representing Hope Story, from a Hope Story perspective, and this plays out in all sorts of areas, but from a Hope Story perspective, the automatic reaction could be, well, I can't be quote-unquote in it because I'm so far away from these spaces. But I would ask you to pause for a second. Maybe you're a teacher or have a background in teaching in this room, you get teaching in a way that a non-teacher just doesn't understand. Perhaps a role that you could play would be to encourage one of our partner school teachers and what they're doing. Or maybe you're a nurse or a doctor, have a medical background. We have a medical center in Burkina Faso with nurses and doctors that would be so encouraged to be supported by someone who gets it, who just understands what it's like. Or maybe you have an agricultural background you could take that passion and skill set and support projects going on at the Amani School in Tanzania. Or maybe you're a cook or a dietitian by trade. You get the need for good nutrition and meals. All of our partners provide meals. Maybe there's a way you could use that to step in and support them. When it comes to renewal, it takes someone to lead and to cast the vision, but then it takes a vast amount of people to make it happen. So when Nehemiah presented this vision for rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem, he pulled literally everybody in. It's just not possible to change the course of a broken community single-handedly or immediately. It takes time and it takes a large amount of people willing to use what they have to pursue this bigger vision. And this isn't just a Hope Story thing. Again, sure, I'm here representing Hope Story, but I'm also here as someone who deeply, deeply believes this and considers what this means in my own life, in my home, in my neighborhood, in my church, in my city, in my country, and in the world. It's an everyday, everybody thing, and it's the call of all believers. So if we take it back to the story of Lego, they forgot their why. And they got distracted by bigger and flashier things. They lost focus of what they were focusing on, what was most important for them, and it literally almost crushed them. 
So as individuals, but also as church communities, it's important to not forget our why. Why do we exist? And we then need each other to sometimes remind us of that. I know that I've needed our Hope Story church partners to remind me of that so I don't get distracted. But also, as local congregations, we just can't do it all. So how do we partner together to support and to encourage and to step in to, into the mission with each other as God's whole church? How I want to close is I want to take us back to Nehemiah 1. So this is when Nehemiah is still with King Artaxerxes, still the cupbearer. He doesn't quite know what's coming at him in this next moment. So Nehemiah 1, verses 1 to 4, says this. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about their Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and all about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This is a really profound thing that Nehemiah models for us. Nehemiah was living his own life, sure, but he also remained connected to the broader Jewish community in other areas. They were his friends and they were his family. So when Han and I came, he asked about how the people were doing. And it seems so simple, yet it's so easy to forget. Nehemiah remembered the people that he didn't see in his everyday life, and then he asked how they were. And your pastor, John, let, basically asked the question to say, hey, how are the Hope Story Church partners doing? And I think asking is a really profound thing. But other, how are, are we supposed to know if we don't ask? And beyond that, when Nehemiah heard of the destruction, he wept and he mourned for days. The pain of the Jewish community in Jerusalem literally became his own pain. And he chose to not just remain comfortable, but to enter in. And I'm wondering if we're willing to do the same. Today, I want to invite you in, on behalf of the Christian community and other areas of the world, if you would enter in even just with prayer with me today. Our Hope Story Church partners, the global church across the board, but bringing it down to just our Hope Story Church partners to make it more digestible, they're facing things that we could not even imagine. They are in the nitty-gritty of it all, but they remain faithful to this vision that God has placed in their hearts. And a simple way for us to join them is through prayer. Because there's so much power in prayer. And in these God-sized visions of renewal, we need God to do what God does and work some miracles. So in a minute, we're going to have a song play. And you'll notice that I've got some bricks on either side of me. And we have sticky notes and pens at this table as well as in the middle. And what I would love to invite you into, um, we have a bunch of prayer requests on the slide, but maybe it's based on something that I've shared. I would love for you to write a simple prayer on that sticky note. It can be one word, it can be one sentence, it can be a paragraph, you can do three sticky notes. Doesn't matter to me, there's no rules. But I would love for you to just spend a moment praying on behalf of these churches around the world that are in the mess of it all, experiencing things that we couldn't even imagine. And then I want you to take that sticky note and take one of the bricks on either side and put it on. And together we're going to build a wall right in front as a sign of, hey, we're with you and we're going to be part of this rebuilding of the wall. You're doing it on the ground and we want to contribute by praying with you. And then after, I want to take a picture of it and hopefully it will be an encouragement to our partners. So it's just a symbolic act of praying for these global churches doing the work. So I'm going to call you both back up. And as the song is playing, as you feel compelled, I would love for you to grab a sticky note, write a prayer on it, grab a block, 
We're going to build a wall together, and then I'll come back after for doing that and for, in this simple way, being part of the rebuilding of broken down walls in communities around the world where the church is stepping in to try to meet really deep, deep needs. So to incur or to finish off, I just want to finish by saying these few things. One, don't forget the why. Don't forget what the mission that we've been called into as individuals, but also as the entire church. To whatever season that you're in today, know that no time is wasted in God's kingdom. You just never know what is going to be prepared in you and around you to be called into what is next. Three, if you think that God has given you a God-sized vision of renewal, lean into that. And don't be afraid to step into uh, boldly inviting others to join in as you obediently respond to that call. Four, if you've been invited into a vision of renewal for a community, consider what your role might be. If we're part of God's church, we have a role in some way. Five, remember to ask. Ask how people are doing, the people immediately around you, the people in your cities, in the country, and in the world. Remember our Christian community beyond where we spend our time. And finally, if there's something in you that would like to partner more with Hope Story and the work that our church partners are doing, we will have a table out there. We would love to chat with you, or you can go to our website. But I want to just thank you for, I guess, asking in a way and letting us share with you about the destroyed walls that are being rebuilt again in these communities around the world, which are rewriting stories of vulnerable kids, allowing them to break free from generational cycles of poverty and to know Jesus through their local church. So thank you for stepping into this invitation with me today.